Let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Ezra, chapter 7, once again. Ezra 7. The last time we left off with verse 20, which reads, And whatsoever more shall be needful for the house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. Whatsoever more shall be needful. Philippians 4.19 states, But my God shall supply all your need, not all your greed, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. A believer should be mindful of that distinction. The TV preachers and the people who listen to them don't seem to be mindful of that distinction. And here, Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, um, which has come along and replaced the kingdom of Babylon, which took the Jews captive initially, and Nebuchadnezzar, they were overtaken by the uh, Medo-Persian Empire, and Artaxerxes reigning from Babylon, uh, so he's referred to as the king of Babylon, but he's also the king of the Persian Empire, and they took over the uh, Babylonian Empire and incorporated it into their own empire. Uh, he's authorizing the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem after the Jews had returned back to their homeland. And he's given Ezra, who is God's scribe, uh, pretty much a blank check to ask of him anything that might be necessary to go into the rebuilding blueprints. You want it? Just say the word. Just ask for it. And uh, let's continue reading, and we'll finish chapter 7, hopefully move into chapter 8 tonight. Let me read verses 21 to 26. And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, <clears throat> excuse me, do make a decree to all the treasurers which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily, unto an hundred talents of silver, and to an hundred measures of wheat, and to an hundred baths of wine, and to an hundred baths of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nephonims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. <clears throat> whatsoever will not, excuse me, and whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death, or to banishment, or to confiscation of goods, or to imprisonment. We'll stop there for a little bit. Uh, verse 21 is the famous verse, some of you might have learned many, many years ago in Sunday school, that uh, contains all the letters of the alphabet, except the letter J. And if you go through it, you'll see all the other letters found within the context, or within the text, rather. And uh, the king rightly recognizes that Ezra is a scribe, quote, of the law of the God of heaven, verse 21, as it also states back in verse 10, uh, but Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. And the rest of this passage, this section we just read, verses 22 to 26, we commented on previously back at chapter 6, verse 8, uh, which we can read again, chapter 6, verse 8, Moreover, I make a decree what you shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. That is, tax money, or tribute as it's called, used uh, to support and prop up the Jews' efforts and the religious efforts of the temple thus outlining the structure of future state church uh, setups in the world, supported by taxpayers, even against their will, 
in the countries of Germany and probably Austria, the official state church was the Lutheran church for a long time. I think they may have two state churches, which the government helps to fund. That would be Lutheranism and Roman Catholicism. Um, and in England, of course, the official religion of the nation is the Anglican Church, the Church of England. Here in America, that church is, got, goes under a different name called Episcopalian. But, uh, and I don't know if the Episcopalian churches here in the U.S. receive any income or any revenue at all from Great Britain or the government of England. I would suspect not, only because there are so many churches here and there that, that the citizens of England would probably rise up in revolt, not wanting to support any foreign churches we have enough churches here that we support nobody and nobody attends. And that's the sad truth of, of the um, Anglican Church in Great Britain. Very few people go to them or attend them. But he's outlining the, the structure of state churches here and um, showing that the state, um, to threaten them with the confiscation of their property or imprisonment or even death if they uh, don't comply here in verse 26. So let's continue with the last two verses, verses 27, 28. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, and hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty princes. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. <clears throat> According to verse 27, God was the author of the king's generosity. I want you to go back, if you will, or rather forward, uh, to the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 16. And Proverbs 16. And verse 1 there reads, The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And Proverbs 21, verse 1. It says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Now that can't be an, an absolute rule for every facet of life upon every man, as John Calvin would have uh, stated and decreed. But it's, it, it's undermined, and let me read to you a, a verse in the New Testament, which undermines the, that very idea. That's from Mark chapter 7. You can write it down, or if you can turn it quickly. Mark chapter 7. In verses 21 and 22, here the Lord Jesus says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. So, uh, according to the extreme teachings of Calvinism, all of those evil things which come from the heart, 13 are actually listed there, would all be a part of the will of God. It would be God working and willing uh, to, do both of his, uh, to both do and the will of his good pleasure, according to Philippians 2.13. And uh, every sane Christian has to reject that idea. Uh, it would mean that every act of, of uh, fraud, every act of debauchery, every act of robbery, theft, rape, murder, um, you name it, tax evasion, tax anything that could be corrupt would be part of the will of God. And so we, we certainly reject that very idea. Uh, your will has to come in line with God's will. Now, the king could have rejected he could have had some impulse to 
show benefit to the Jews, which would have been a prompting of God. And then he had a, has a, his own will. He could have rejected it, could have changed his mind, said, I'm not going to do that. I had an idea, but I don't want to be seen as soft in the eyes of, of the people in the kingdom. In verse 28, Ezra says, And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. The expression is found several places um, at this time in the Old Testament history, four times in the, here in the book of Ezra, and two times later in the book of Nehemiah. And it has to do with God's protective good fortune coming on a man, uh, the blessings he couldn't have possibly arranged by himself. Job speaks of the hand of God a number of times, but for him... It referred to God's ultimate uh, judgment of all men and his power to send misery upon a man as well. Uh, King David uh, similarly mentions the right hand of God. But in those cases, it it, uh, becomes an indirect reference to Jesus Christ, through whom God will execute judgment against all of Israel's enemies one day. Uh, Psalm 110 Verse 1 reads, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, excuse me, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And in Psalm 110, verse 5, we read, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. So in this, but in these cases here at Ezra and Nehemiah, that expression, um, the the hand of the Lord has to do with God's good fortune and providence upon Ezra and Nehemiah and the people uh, to bring about the rebuilding of the temple as they are ended their captivity in Babylon. Let's move into chapter 8 for a little while and let's read the first 14 verses. I'm going to do my best because a lot of names listed here that we don't name our children any longer. Uh, Ezra 8, starting with verse 1. These are now the chief of their fathers, and this is the genealogy of them that went up with me from Babylon in the reign of Artaxerxes the king. Of the sons of Phinehas, Gershom. Of the sons of Ithamar, Daniel. Of the sons of David, Hattush. Of the sons of Shechaniah, of the sons of Pharosh, Zechariah, and with him were reckoned by genealogy of the males an hundred and fifty. Of the sons of Peath Moab, uh, Elihoenai, the son of Zerahiah, and with him two hundred males. Of the sons of Shechaniah, the son of Jehaziel, and with him three hundred males. Of the sons also of Aden, Ebed, the son of Jonathan, and with him fifty males. And of the sons of Elam, Jeshaiah, the son of Athaliah, and with him seventy males. And of the sons of Shephatiah, Zebediah, the son of Michael, and with him fourscore males. Of the sons of Joab, Obadiah, the son of Jehiel, and with him two hundred and eighteen males. And of the sons of Shalomith, the son of uh, Josephiah, and with him an hundred and threescore males. And of the sons of Bibi, Zechariah, the son of Bibi, and with him twenty and eight males. And of the sons of Asgad, Johanan, the son of Hakatan, and with him an hundred and ten males. And of the last sons of Adonikam, whose names are these, Eliphalet, Jeel, Jeel, and Shimei, and with them threescore males. Of the sons also of Bigvai, Uthai and Zabud, and with them 70 males. Here we have one of those long, dreary, boring lists of names and boring sections of the Bible. And uh, there's no reason to candy coat it and deny that it's not boring and tedious. If you want to have trouble falling asleep, read sections of the Bible like this. You'll be out before you can before you know it. But it contains exact names and exact numbers. 
And um, since genealogies are historical by nature, they're not doctrinal, they're not devotional. Um, this listing, as other places of the Bible, uh, serves a dual purpose. Number one, it shows God is interested in anybody who is even tangentially uh, connected to his son. God's interested in his son, and he's interested in anyone who's interested in his son, and he's interested in those who preceded the coming of Christ in his genealogy. And second, even the most insignificant people, like those listed here, get their names in a book that will be here long after heaven and earth have passed away. Uh, Christ said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Um, however, I want you to go back to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 32. And we'll start with verse 31. 31 through 33. Exodus 32, beginning at verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sins, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. I want you to also go, well, so evidently, let me say this, there's a, a, there was a book kept by God with the names of his saints in it long before Moses ever showed up and began writing the book of Genesis. I want you to go uh, to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. The last book in your Bible, Revelation 3. Revelation 3, and notice here verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. I never gave it much thought until sometime recently Brother Everett and I were discussing this and um, it does seem that God removes names out of book in which they were already recorded. Uh, we always think of God adding names to the book of life when someone gets saved. But go forward to Revelation 13. I want to give Brother Charles due credit. He's a thinker. Sister Janet is as well. She's always coming to me with questions on certain Bible verses, hoping I can shed light on it or provide her a, more under, a better understanding. And uh, she asks some good questions too. She, she keeps me on my toes. Revelation 13, and let's read verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There it sounds like uh, people will worship the beast because they're unsaved, and because their names are not, because they never got saved, that's why their names are not written in the book of life. But let me have you turn to a couple more verses. Revelation 17. Revelation 17. And verse 8 there. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And Revelation 20, verse 15.
Revelation 20, verse 15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There are a couple of other references which we won't turn to. That's Revelation 21, 27, and 22, verse 19. And I thought of a few questions looking at this verse earlier today. Are their names removed the moment they die without Jesus Christ? In the tribulation, were all of their names removed the moment they were left behind after the rapture? Or as soon as they gave worship to the beast, did God remove their name out of the book of life at that moment? In the tribulation, can a man uh, uh, keep from having his name removed through faith and works and diligently avoiding the man of sin, the Antichrist, aiding the Jew in his worst, worst time of persecution uh, until the visible return of the Lord Jesus at his, his uh, glorious second coming. And I may be... I may say this prematurely, but I'm tempted to say yes to all of those scenarios. So that the one verse which says uh, their names were not, they, those worship the beast whose names were not found written in the book of life, maybe their names had been deleted out of that book uh, once the rapture occurred and they died without Jesus Christ. Or once they consciously decided to give reverence and worship to the man of sin. But like I say, we've always assumed that God's adding names to his book. But those that verse we read in Exodus 32 and Revelation 3 verse 5 seem to suggest that the names have all been recorded there. God has been deleting those who die without him in the Old Testament, someone who who died uh, among the unrighteous, he was more n known more for his wickedness than for any desire to please God and, and keep the commandments, and uh, and even that even that diligence had to be maintained up until the time of his death, or he would die among the unrighteous, according to Ezekiel 18, and that person woke up in Abraham's bosom, someone who was faithful until death, they woke up, or rather that person woke up on the side of torment, and someone who was faithful until death uh, woke up in hell on the side of Abraham's bosom. And that person got a chance to receive Christ once Christ died and descended and led them, uh, those out of Abraham's bosom, into a captivity in heaven, uh, the good kind of captivity. But... Um, now, I'm going to try to... I'm going to try to research this a little bit more, but the language of the verses seem to suggest that there's a list of names uh, which God is forced to erase when that person dies, having never trusted Christ as their Savior. It's a very simple thing to do so, and uh, the idea that God's got eternity waiting for every person whose name is in that book, and they die without any interest in the Lord Jesus Christ, having never said, cried out to him, God, I'm a sinner, please save me. And that name seems to have then been then be erased out of God's book. And uh, God had a book of names recorded even before Moses sat down to write, like I said, the, the first five books of the Bible. 